one student and not another student. One student may think you're the best teacher that ever lived. The other teacher, or the other student may say, I just don't get that guy. I just don't get him. And it has to do with the style that you use in teaching and the style that the student has in learning. Now, we'll get to this in a minute, but I want you to have a copy and we're going to take this little test because we're going to learn your style. And that will reveal the student that you best connect with and the student that you don't connect very well with. Okay? <clears throat> but before we get to learning styles, we want to talk about learning levels. Uh, some of you have said, uh, I have trouble with my students. Uh, they don't seem to get it. I don't know how to communicate. Uh, folks, it is very complicated. I'm not going to tell you that it's an easy thing. I'm not going to tell you that you can waltz into a classroom and be the best teacher ever was immediately. It's not going to happen. Uh, you've got to learn something about the dynamics of learning. Okay? And first, we're going to talk about levels of learning. <clears throat> the first level of learning is rote learning. This is the ability to repeat memorized information with little thought as to the meaning. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you learned many things that you know by rote. Somebody tell me a television program for children that is an ideal uh, example of rote learning. Sesame Street. Sesame Street, absolutely. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, whatever. I, my Spanish is <laughs> my Spanish is uh, is lacking. How many tarts does the the count have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. How many steps did he fall down? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, you don't have to understand the relationship of the numbers. You just have to be able to recite them. Tell me something you learned by rote. The elements. Of the, of the, all the elements of the I, I knew what you were saying. I was just amazed. I never did learn those things. I was supposed to. I know. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, what else did you learn by rote? Yes. Pledge of Allegiance, okay. Just said it every, and when I was going to school, you said it every morning. No. How about multiplication tables? Did you learn those? Yeah. Tell me in Bible class something you learned by rote. The Old Testament. Yeah. Books of the Bible. Yeah. Books of the Old Testament, books of the New Testament. Yeah. Uh, names of the Apostles. I've always said if the names of the Apostles was on the test to get into heaven, you'd have to let me sing them. <laughs> Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, yeah. We learn a lot of things by rote. That is the most basic level of learning. I think we're pretty good at that. We have Bible drills. But that's not deep learning. The second level is recognition. Recognition is the ability to recognize concepts. It's one thing to know 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And it's another thing to understand that each of those is a conceptual thing. Uh, I told somebody earlier, the only value that I know of learning the books of the Bible is so we know where to find stuff. I don't think there's any intrinsic value in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. I, I don't think there's any intrinsic value in that. Uh, it's, that helps us find stuff. So as we progress past rote, we begin to understand concepts. <clears throat> My father told me that when he was a, a child that there was a boy in class who would bring dimes to school and he and some others would trade him nickels for the dime. Now, why would somebody trade a nickel for a, or a dime for a nickel? Because a nickel's bigger. What did that kid not get? 
the concept of the dime being worth more than the nickel, though it was smaller, that's a concept. He might have said this is a dime and this is a nickel. But he did not understand the concept of what each one represented. The third level is restatement. Restatement is the ability to state the concept in one's own words or to see the relationship of concepts to stated ideals. That means you're beginning to get it and you can say it. When somebody tells me, well, I understand it, but I just can't put it in words, you know what I know? They don't understand it. Because a part of understanding a concept is you're able to put it in words. Now, you may put it in your words. They may not be the words I would use. We're going to do a little exercise in a moment. and We're going to talk about uh, the plan of salvation. You know, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Uh, I would say that repentance is a change of mind that ultimately leads to a change of actions. How might a child say that? Yeah, I'm sorry, I did some bad stuff and I'm not going to do it anymore. Okay, they get it. That's not the words I would use, but that's restatement in the words that a child would use. That is a level of learning. And then there is relation. That is the ability to see the relation of a particular truth to life and to make an appropriate response. Many times we think things are true, we just don't see how it fits me. We don't see how that relates to me. What does this have to do with me? And frankly, may I tell you that in lots of our sermons and classes, we leave that to people to figure out and they never do. We think they'll get it and they don't. And so uh, our job is to explain the relationship of this truth to life. And the final <coughs> level of learning is realization. That is the ability to apply information learned to daily life. That means I do it. I not only get it in the relation, but I do it in the realization. Now, let me go back and go through these again. This time with our plan of salvation. Did you learn in class, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized? Did you learn that? Yeah. Okay. At rote learning, what are we able to do? Recite it. Recite it. Now may I just say this will also help when somebody says, I've got this child who is about nine years old who's bugging me to death about being baptized. And are they ready? And what we confuse is their ability to say, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized with their ability to understand, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. My good friend Sam Bartrug, who, whom I referenced last night, was walking on the country road where they lived with his son Ike. And Ike said some big word. And his dad said, Ike, I didn't know you knew that word. He said, Daddy, I can say it, but I don't know what it means. I think lots of times we can say it, but we don't know what it means. It's important that we learn to say it, but that's rote. And I think you could teach a parent to say, here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That doesn't mean we're going to be in the business of baptizing parents, okay? That's rote learning. At recognition level, what are we going to do with here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized? We're going to understand that each of those words represents a concept. Believe is a word, but it's a concept. What does it mean to believe? What do you believe? Who do you believe? Repent is a word, but it's also a concept. What does it mean to repent? And so when that child comes to me and says, I want to be baptized, and I say, why? And they say, here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I say, okay, good job. What's it mean to repent? Uh, here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Yeah, I know. But what's it mean to repent? Uh, you got to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I know, but what does it mean to repent? 
And when the child cannot tell me, you know what I know? I don't want to discourage children, but I know they're not ready to be baptized because they are not at the recognition level of understanding that those words represent concepts and they don't get to concepts. At restatement level, I say, uh, what does it mean to repent? And the child says, uh, well, well, I know, I just don't know how to say it. And you know what I know? They don't know. I'm willing to give them a lot of slack and let them use language that they would use, but I want to know that they mean, that they understand that repentance means that you've done some things you should not do, you're sorry for that, and you're going to change as best you can. I, I want that, that idea to come across. And I want the child to restate that concept to me. And that's, that's a major level of learning. At relation, I want them to understand something about the relationship of those principles to salvation. For instance, baptism. Why water? What does that do? Do they understand that water brings us into contact with the blood of Jesus which was shed in his death? I think that's an important concept, folks. I think you've got to get that. Or else you're taking a bath, okay? You've got to understand that that, that, that baptism is a reunite or is a uniting with the blood of Christ. I love your baptism pool here and the cross above it. I don't know whose idea it was, but, but I get that. I mean, that cross is central to what's being done in that water. It's that blood. <clears throat> we sing, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The power is not in that water. You know that. That's the same water that's used elsewhere in this building for a variety of purposes. But that water brings us into union with the blood of Jesus. Romans 6. I want people to get that. Now they may not understand, might not understand all of the uh, fine points about that, but they need to understand the relationship of baptism. And then realization, they say, I, I need to do that. Not only does my dad and my mother, not only do other folks, but I need to do that. Now, <clears throat> Where do you think we are in most of our Bible classes? I'll back up here because I figure that's, we're somewhere on that one. What do you think we're really good at in Bible class? Wrote. Wrote. Who can name the books of the Bible? Who can name the apostles? Who was the first man? Who was the first woman? And, and all of that stuff. I, I'm not uh, casting reflection on that kind of stuff. I'm just saying if we never get past that we never have the depth of learning that we ought to have. We've got to go past that. Uh, maybe we do fairly well with recognition. Maybe we understand something about concepts. But I would hope we would take this levels thing and make sure our classes go to the highest level. <clears throat> and that ultimately is the realization where people say, hey, I need to do that. When you get there, guess what? You've had class. Wonderful things have happened. Okay, before we go on, because there's another whole section here, what about questions about levels of learning? Or comments about levels of learning? Yes? It's not only it applies to children, but also to adults. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to say something that you may think is demeaning, but I was told as a preacher Never underestimate the ignorance of your audience. And I don't mean to be demeaning. I think we assume that people are where we are and they're not. And we need to start where people are and lead them to where they need to be. Instead, we just generally expect them to be where we are. So we start off where we are and they're lost. We need to start where people are and they may not be at the high, ready for the highest level of learning at all. Especially you're working with new converts and people who are unchurched and they don't have a clue. And so we stick them in the revelation class. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, Jim. Uh, it's been brought up as having uh, just uh, unruly 
three children in the mm -hmm. class. Also, with this, you've got um, learning disability. Mm -hmm. And that can happen in the church, just like public school. Do you know of anyone that has addressed that successfully in the Bible school program, where you've got either a, a, it's a discipline issue, or maybe the child has a, is ADHD or something, and has learning disability, and just cannot do what the other kids deserve? Is there, is there a way to address that? Or <coughs> to address, or? I know churches that have several students who have learning disabilities and have a class for them. Now, you have to have a church of some size, and you have to have teachers that are prepared to do that because that's a tough class to teach. I have a learning disabled granddaughter, and so I know firsthand about this situation. She's 22 years old. Chronologically, she's about six or seven, and uh, uh, she's a handful in class if the teacher doesn't understand and cannot deal with her, and... Uh, uh, she has been in classes especially for her, and she does very well in classes like that. Uh, when it's a discipline problem, I think that needs to be addressed by having somebody who knows how to handle that situation. The average teacher doesn't quite know what to do. Uh, Gwen, uh, to, a, to a teacher who's never had a learning disabled child, would not know how to handle Gwen. And Gwen would be a constant distraction. Uh, to, to teachers who have come to understand her, she is amazingly good in class. But uh, you have to uh, uh, ha expect these sometimes off-the-wall behavior or off-the-wall answer. My general feeling about discipline is that we only need to do something uh, in, a, in a remedial way when the uh, action uh, causes trouble to the learning situation. If it shuts down the learning situation, I cannot let the behavior of one student uh, ruin the class for everybody else. And then I need to do something remedially. <laughs> However, there are things that we can do in discipline, and somebody else asked about this. Uh, do you realize the root of the word discipline? Disciple. That's exactly it. It's not about kicking somebody out of your class. It's not. <clears throat> now, you may have to ultimately do that. But first of all, it's about the structure of a class that keeps kids engaged. Uh, and often, if the, if the class is well-structured <clears throat> and the teacher is on the ball... You don't ever have a discipline problem. Sometimes it's something as simple as walking around in the classroom. And this young lady, I picked on her before, but let's suppose she's our problem child, and all I have to do is stand right here and keep teaching. And I don't have to say a word. She knows I'm observing her. And although I understand that you have to be careful about touching, but if I lay my hand on her shoulder, she knows, buddy, uh, I've got my eye on her, and, and she better shape up. And sometimes it's something as simple as movement throughout the classroom. But if you structure your program to where you're doing something, there's not a lot of downtime where everybody's sitting, but people are engaged, and you're doing some of these creative kind of things, and there's movement in the classroom. Uh, it's unreasonable to take small children and expect to go, and to go into a classroom and sit still for 45 minutes. People get real. Wake up and smell the coffee. That's just unreasonable. <laughs> so uh, let's arrange for uh, movement. Uh, when my wife taught cradle roll, she had uh, cars made out of cardboard. And uh, she was teaching about the importance of church. And she had clothes in the classroom, and they would all get dressed. She would have a tie, and the little boys would put on a tie, and they would put on a hat, and the little girls would put on dress and walk around in high heels. And she was teaching them that it was important to get ready to go to church. And then it was always, go get your Bible, and they would go get their Bible, and then they would get in the car, and somebody would push them to Bible school. And they would arrive at the church building, and you say, that's silly. That's good teaching. That's good teaching for little kids. Because 
First of all, they're not going to be a discipline problem because this is fun. They're learning, but it's fun. Okay? And they're learning something about getting ready to go to church, about taking your Bible to church, about arriving on time, about getting out and being friendly and greeting each other, uh, about dressing up, uh, uh, not that there's a clothing code, but that it's, it's a special thing that you're doing. That's good teaching. And so a lot of discipline problems can be taken care of just by classroom structure. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to add that sometimes with special needs, they need, they're very tactile. Mm-hmm. So if there was any way, you could have, like you were saying before, the learning centers are mm-hmm. always good. But if you had a corner of the room yes. where there were just you know, smooth yep. 